Okay, welcome. Thank you for attending this H0P55 seminar on offshore transmission topology optimization. Can everyone hear my voice? See my slides in full screen? Yeah, see the mouse pointer? Okay, good. Well, thanks again. Without further delay, let's begin. I will start today with a description of the offshore wind topology optimization problem and the reasons for studying such a problem. Then, I'll introduce the necessary background theory before describing the model and optimization approach we have developed. Finally, a case study of the Belgian offshore region will be presented. So, what is an offshore wind topology optimization problem? In the top left figure, there is a possible future scenario for offshore wind in the North Sea, as described by ENSOE. You can see different clusterings of offshore wind power plants. If we were to zoom in on one of these clusters, you might see something that's similar to this central figure here, where you have turbines covering the entire surface, and then these three points here represent points of common coupling, which are substations onshore that connect to the greater European grid. If you were to cluster these turbines into groups, you'd get something that looks something like this. Now these would be representative of what we call now concessions, a group of offshore turbines connected to a substation, and then these stars are then the geographic centers of these concessions. The question now becomes, how do you find the optimal transmission topology to get the energy generated here to the onshore grid for consumption? To answer this question, we have to look at a few different things. First, what technology are we gonna use? There's HVAC, which is the most common connection method, but there's also HVDC, which is becoming more common. And as a side note, I suppose, it's good to mention there is a third possible technology, LFAC, standing for low frequency AC, whereby transmission is made at less than 50 hertz in order to reduce the impact of reactive power in the AC system. This type of transmission, however, is only theoretical really, it's not applied in practice yet, uh, and so we've decided not to include it in this optimization model. What is included, however, is midpoint compensation. This is where you place a offshore substation halfway between shore and the wind power plant, and you place reactive compensation there in order to reduce reactive currents and extend the range of HVAC. We also have to decide what transmission voltage will be used. In this study, 220 kV and 400 kV are considered in HVAC, plus minus 150 and plus minus 300 for HVDC. Collector voltage. Collector circuits bring the power directly from the turbines to the offshore substation. Traditionally, this has been 33 kV, but 66 kV is being uh, adapted generally moving forward, and that's what we consider in this. The topologies that we look at, there's meshed and radial. Now, the simplest case, the radial case, you can see here, as well as another variation here. This is often the cheapest topology and the most employed, but occasionally, it is warranted to put mesh connections between offshore substations. So this is where you get a mesh topology. And we can't discount mesh topologies because they are occasionally the optimal solution and so they are included in the study. The number and location of OSS is not concluded, or not fixed, sorry. So we could have multiple OSS. In this case, we have one. In this case, we have two and we don't know where they're going to be. That's an optimization variable we have to determine. Furthermore, what's the equipment that's used in the transmission system? What's its size? 
do you have a single piece of equipment, say like a single large transformer, or is it better to have two parallel transformers of lower capacity? But then if one fails, you still have say 50% capacity remaining. That's another uh, comparison that has to be made and optimized. Where is the offshore compensation as far as AC goes? When choosing a voltage level, uh, it can be quite important because it influences the cables. For example, 400 kV may have less losses, of course, than 220 kV, but at 400 kV, you'd have to install three individual cables versus one cable with three conductors inside. The cost for doing so, of course, may completely outweigh the cost gained through lower losses. Now we'll go through a little bit of background as to what we were just discussing, bring anyone who's not familiar with these topics fully up to speed. So HVAC versus HVDC. At the top, a typical HVAC system is shown where you have your wind power plant, medium voltage cable connects to a substation, which is then stepped up to transmission level voltage, sent to shore, and then connected to the grid at large. On occasion, as mentioned, you may want to put a midpoint compensation substation halfway between shore and the power plant. This is really done only when distances start to get very long and it's done to increase the range of AC. So before 100 kilometers or so, it's not likely worthwhile. There's some pros and cons to wave. Of course, AC is a very well-known technology. It's proven. The capex is is relatively or comparatively lower when looking at HVDC systems because you don't have to pay for converters. But in HVAC systems, uh, reactive power is a problem. And as you get to higher transmission levels, you have to put more and more equipment in parallel in order to handle that capacity. With HVDC, we see the system set up as follows. You still have a medium voltage collector grid, but it goes to a converter station offshore, steps, steps it up, or changes the voltage, sorry, converts it to HVDC, transmitted to shore. There's an inverter station, which then connects to the European grid. This has very high capex. That's its major drawback, and that's because of these two converter stations. But it has the advantage of effective long distance high power uh, capability. So after about 100 or more kilometers, uh, that's when HVDC starts to really become a solution that should be analyzed. Examining quickly a little more detail about the costs associated with it. Here we see in HVAC, cables are the majority of the cost. They really start to add up quickly. And for HVDC, by contrast, it's the converters. And you have to buy these converters no matter the size or distance. So it's a lot of upfront capital. This creates a little bit of a tug of war between these two where as you move farther from shore and and uh, the capacity increases of course the cost of the HVAC cable starts to increase drastically the converters increase at a slower pace so that's why you get an overtaking of HVAC to HVDC another important point is that when you look at the total cost of the electrical system the transmission system contributes quite a bit more to this cost compared to the collector circuit. So it makes sense to start with this approach where we optimize the transmission system overall first, then we optimize the medium voltage collector circuit to fit in to the previously determined transmission system. There's more to gain by doing it in this order than the inverse. When modeling offshore, there's certain knowns, of course, inputs into the system. 
This is the Belgian offshore with the Dutch concession shown as well. Now the things that you know when you're starting off trying to find a transmission system, of course you know the future capacity. You know what the number of turbines and how and the size of them that will be put offshore. And you know generally their location, a set of GPS coordinates. From the size or number of turbines, you you essentially know how far they'll be spaced given the power density within the region that you're modeling. So you can determine an approximate area that each concession will make. And because you know the geographic location, you can access historical wind time series. So you can again make a good approximation as to the generation regime that will occur at this location. We model candidate connections in this situation. So we have ones that are going from offshore to onshore. These start at the wind farm and then end at the point of common coupling. This is the DC connection shown. So you have two converters and DC cable in the center. This one down here, the DC connection, of course, as well, but you have a mid uh, an additional AC substation in between the converter and the wind power plant. The typical AC connection shown here and the midpoint compensation connection. Then you have offshore to offshore candidates. Medium voltage goes from the collection grid to the OSS and then any OSS connections to other OSS connections in this model are HVAC. All of the costs for any one of these connections is the sum of the capex required, any maintenance throughout the lifespan, losses throughout the lifespan, both I squared R, so variable losses are considered, as well as fixed losses in the transformer cores. And then there's this value, expected energy not transmitted, which I'll go into uh, briefly in the next slide. So the cost breakdown shown neatly here where you have, you can group them into root losses or root costs and terminal costs. Terminal costs are of course anything associated with the onshore or offshore substations. Root costs, anything associated with the cabling or compensation for the cabling. Then within those subcategories, each one has a capex cost, labor and materials and opex. And opex is the combination of maintenance, losses, and this one again, expected energy not transmitted, which I'll now explain. So looking at this graph, we see this is the generation profile of an offshore wind power plant considering uh, a general wind regime. So we can see that because of the wind, the power plant is at 100% output approximately for 2,000 hours within a year, about a quarter of the time. And then the rest of the year, it's at some value in between there that we can see here, including zero. So expected energy not transmitted is the cost of any energy that is generated by the wind farm, but for some reason, we are not allowed or not able to sell to the market. So we just lose any profit from that energy. And this comes perhaps because of a contingency within the system. So imagine we have a wind farm connected by two cables in parallel. So when both cables are functional, no matter where the wind, farm, wind power plant is generating at even 100%, the capacity of those two cables is enough to transmit any energy generated to shore. So there would be zero constrained energy. But if we lose one of those cables due to failure, now we can still transmit some power, but we only have 50% capacity or one cable. So now as long as the wind regime is such that it's not at full generation capacity, there is no constrained energy. We still haven't maxed out our cable capacity. But as soon as it passes above that, we enter this blue region, which is constrained energy. And that's energy that is generated 
but due to some contingency in the system, we cannot transmit it to shore and sell it. So we take that constrained energy, and then we take the sum of all of it. This K here is the cost of energy. That gives you expected energy not transmitted. And P uh, IJ, that is the availability of whatever piece of equipment that you're looking at, which is a function, of course, the failure rate of that equipment and how long does it take to repair it, the mean time to repair offshore. So when we combine these two or all these technologies at one specific point, here's 600 megawatts, we get an idea of how they interact with each other and the windows where each one is the lowest cost option versus the other. So if we follow this blue line here, we see this is the HVAC, the typical option or the most common option. So up to about 100 kilometers, it is the best choice. Then you move a little beyond that, and all of a sudden, putting a compensation platform makes it cheaper to do that as the HVAC system increases in cost. So then there's this window here where AC, but with a compensation platform, is the lowest cost. And it increases for a while until about 180 kilometers, and then HVDC overtakes it. And now anywhere beyond here, HVDC is the cheapest option. This second HVDC is because it includes a second AC substation. Of course, if you have to do that, the entire cost of the system increases and the point occurs later on. Why HVAC is overtaken uh, by DC and compensation platforms is displayed in this figure. So now really just look at the blue, the root capex. We see HVAC starts off quite low when you're fairly close to shore much lower than the other two, but then as it gets farther and farther from shore, the cost of that cabling starts to skyrocket. It increases exponentially. Comparing this to the HVDC option where you start off with a higher capex at the start, but it's just a linear function as it increases, essentially related to the length of cable. The cable doesn't increase per kilometer. It you just need an extra kilometer at the same unit price. And really the same is the case for the compensated platform HVAC. Um, but the linear increase in the compensation platform is steeper than that for HVDC. So that's why eventually it's overtaken by it as well at distances further out. Looking at the entire optimization region, we get something similar to this where we have purely HVAC regions, HVAC with compensated platform regions, and then this is purely HVDC. The black and the green in the middle are regions where it's not immediately easy to know whether it would be HVDC or HVAC. It's sort of within the error of the economic models. Now, the typical approach to modeling a problem like this is a mixed integer problem transmission network expansion problem. This is whereby any equipment is considered a candidate line or a candidate transformer, and it's represented by a binary number. Then you try to minimize the total cost of all selected equipment. This is of course subject to network physics and any operational limits of the network, such as voltage levels. This type of modeling applied to offshore uh, topology optimization has some problems, some major drawbacks. The main one really is that the search space needed for a problem like this, because it's there is no existing grid and everything is a candidate piece of equipment being a greenfield problem. The number of candidates required is huge and you just can't really handle the number required. So you can see here at five and a half hours, well into the exponential curve of computational complexity, you've, already, you've only got 4,000 candidate lines. 
but the Belgian offshore, for example, it, without uh, effective candidate reduction algorithm, you'd be looking at around 40,000, not tractable. Something that adds to this complexity is the fact that in this situation, compared to onshore transmission expansion plans, there's no fixed locations for the OSS. We don't know where these OSS will go yet. They aren't built. So that adds more candidates substantially. And we also want to be able to track the wind profiles, as we were showing before, that for um, expected energy not transmitted, you need to know what the wind profile is to get that power flow curve. To reduce very large problem sizes with this, often clustering or different uh, reduction techniques are employed. These reduction techniques uh, really nullify any claim on global optimality because you're solving a different problem than the original one that was too large. And we're using these mathematical formulations often because we think it necessary to have a guarantee on that optimal solution. So you've nullified one of the most important uh, reasons for choosing this type of problem. Why didn't you just choose a heuristic where you get a pretty good solution on a larger problem, but you just don't know if it's globally optimal or not? Finally, when you do get a solution, there's only one. And this solution hopefully matches your needs. But if it doesn't, and there's some constraint that wasn't considered, and you can't use that solution in the real world, well, then you're pretty stuck. And you essentially have to rethink all your constraints uh, or how you're formulating the problem, and then start from scratch again, redo the calculation. So we've be developed a different optimization approach that I'll describe now, and it's designed really to deal with some of these issues that we were just discussing. So the first thing is that we've made a division immediately between radial and mesh topologies. So the following description applies entirely to radial topologies, and then we'll introduce the mesh connections later on. So the mathematical model that we've developed, you represent each offshore wind power plant by a number and they're ordered in distance to the PCC. This is this A set here. It's really just a set of uh, counting numbers up to N wind farms. You can then represent all combinations of these N wind farms by the set of binary numbers that count up to, uh, up to N. So it's actually two to the n minus one binary numbers. That's this set B. To give this a little concrete example, uh, the, this value of J, so one, 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 or 15, uh, is represented by this topology here. And that's that because all of the digits in the binary number are one, all of the wind farms in this offshore region are connected. All of these binary numbers combined uh, result in situations where you can then break them down further. So in this situation, you have J111 or 15, but you can actually rewrite that as the sum of 3 and 12 in binary. This 12 represents this topology. This three represents this topology. And then you can combine those to a new topology that's still represented by this J, but is different from the original variation. This breaking down of binary numbers can continue even further. So it's not just one level, it can be done repetitively. In this example, you can see here, we have uh, 1110 represented by this topology, but that number can in turn be represented uh, by these two binary numbers. And then that results in two topologies like this that are the broken down variation of this one. Combining these three, we get another topo topological variation of J 
equals 50. When you group all of these together, you obtain an exhaustive combinatorial space, which can be written quite concisely. And in fact, a benefit of this notation is you have three indices that make it very easy to access any one of these topological combinations with just three indices. So we have our exhaustive combinatorial space, but unfortunately in reality everything's more difficult. So we also actually have to consider what is called an exhaustive topological space. This means that for each each binary that's included in the combinatorial space, there may actually be multiple variations of electrical topologies. That's because you have, for example, HV and MV cables. So this is J equals 1, 1, but you could have a medium voltage variation where you have medium cable shown here in blue, uh, connected to a single substation and then transmitted to shore or a high voltage one where all of the cabling is high voltage and you have two substations. So there's even more variations within the topological space than in the mathematical combinatorial space. So how would we search such a large search space? <laughs> this is where we present the greedy algorithm developed. So this greedy algorithm, first off, it searches the entire topological space easily using these indices and it does this efficiently by crossing existing topologies so you don't have to recalculate all the equipment within each topology to get new ones in this case the only new calculation is this cable here another benefit of doing it this way is that the optimal position of the substation can be found and really it's a very simple operation once you know the cables connecting to a substation and you know the costs of them you can just minimize those costs and that's a little something like this where really there's a point where all the cables the sum of costs of all cables connected to that substation is the lowest cost and that's where that substation should be we can also calculate the optimal equipment and technology by solving a mixed integer program but this is done only at the nodal level so you can have multiple voltage levels uh, and multiple technologies and this will find the optimal variation because we're looking at a nodal level it's actually quite simple also to sum all incoming wind profiles and we can track the sources of the wind easily Furthermore, some additions to this is in the inner loop, we've employed a sorted priority queue in order to reduce temporal complexity. This algorithm has been proved correct. It guarantees the optimal global solution provided a single transmission voltage is employed. I'll explain a little what that means. This proof is done via the greedy stays ahead principle, by the way. And if you're interested, the proof is provided in the reference below. But what I mean by a single transmission voltage is that it's not that you can't look at say 220 and 400 kV, but uh, the proof is that if you have only 220 kV, say for all your OSS to OSS connections and OSS to PCC, then the topology found with only 220 is the optimal 220 variation. If you have one that's only 400 kV, then it's the optimal one with 400 kV. Um, you may find that the algorithm gives you one with a 220 and 400 kV line in it, and it's cheaper than the 200 kV on its own and the 400 kV on its own. Well then, um, you you know you found the best topology compared to single voltage levels, but you can't actually prove it using this proof that there's no other multiple voltage level topology that is cheaper. The reduction in search space is really what makes this algorithm effective. And so what we've what we found is that in order to 
guarantee the optimal solution is found with the stays ahead, greedy stays ahead principle is that at each iteration, we don't have to keep all the topologies within the queues. We only have to carry over the lowest cost topology within each queue. Uh, and that's a substantial reduction on search space. The greedy search returns a set of uh, optimal solutions. So it doesn't just find the optimal solution for n offshore wind power plants. It actually find, finds the optimal radial solution, considering only a single export cable, that's important, uh, for j less than or equal to n uh, offshore wind power plants. Excuse me. Um, this set we've called th star. And it's important to see, uh, highlighted, that all, because of the greedy stays ahead principle, all partial radial solutions are also optimal radial solutions. So from this, how do we find the globally optimal topology that has perhaps more than one export cable? Well, starting with TH star, it's actually quite simple. You do, starting at J equals one, you can start to combine radial topologies. So you take these first two, this. And you can see this is connecting the same offshore wind power plants as this topology here. So you can compare them. Is one cheaper than the other? If it is, update the topology. Then you can move steadily through the set until you get to the final topology of n offshore wind power plants. And this is then, in fact, the globally optimal radial solution for um, one or more radial connections. And the proof as to why this works is actually quite simple. Uh, it's This is the sum of individual radial connections. So these are still not meshed, right? This is a radial connection, and this is a radial connection. So because the cost of this system is the sum of separate radial connections, the lowest cost variation has to be the sum of all the optimal variations at each one of those radial connections. So you see this one here, this was the optimal connecting these two, and this one here is the optimal connecting these two. So it, it's necessary that all radial connections found in this solution are also found within TH star. How do we include meshed topologies now? So we have TH star, and we know that as we're finding the optimal, globally optimal radial, we're getting topologies similar to this. Well, at this point, we can also check for meshed connections. And then we have to know, OK, is one worthwhile putting in? So how do we do that? This goes back to expected energy not transmitted. So here we have. Let's look at this one here, where we have a connection from offshore wind power plant two to shore. And this is the profile generated by the offshore wind power plant. With no mesh connection. That entire profile, or all power generated, has to pass through this cable. If we add a mesh connection, however, then some is diverted. So that is represented by this profile here. So it's reduced a little bit. And then if we have a contingency condition, so we lose one of those cables, again, we only get 50% capacity. But this constrained energy is reduced because some is diverted via the mesh connection. Now, we do the exact same thing for all the equipment under n minus n contingencies and calculate the expected energy not transmitted. And if the total savings in expected energy not transmitted is greater than the cost of putting in this mesh connection, then that is a better topology to choose, and it is selected. So now we'll take time to look at some case studies uh, and put this in practice as to how the algorithm actually works. First. We'll look at a little bit of a toy problem just to know how everything's set up. Keep in mind that at this point, 
we are fixing the OSS position. This is really because the mixed integer formulation is not formulated to easily handle many substation positions. So in this toy problem, we have two offshore wind power plants, 350 and 250 megawatts. And they're about uh, an average of 45 kilometers offshore. Displayed here are all 220 candidate lines and substations. So we have two substations here and then two at each offshore wind power plant. The red lines are medium voltage and these high voltage candidates are 220. The full system studied is about uh, is double this because there is a 400 kV grid laid on top and not shown here. But together, all of those results in 32 candidate lines. Solving this, we get this is the optimal connection topology, and that's medium voltage cables to one OSS and then 400 kV to shore. Both the gene or, uh, greedy algorithm and uh, the TNEP, or the mixed integer problem, found the same solution or same objective function, and in fact, it is the same solution, uh, and both take about the same amount of time. Scaling up the problem, we look at one that has four offshore wind power plants that are an average of 61.6 .6 to shore, and one that has six at almost 70 kilometers offshore. When we do this and we solve them with both algorithms, we find that the objective functions and of course the, the topology layouts, which aren't shown here, they are the same. So the same solutions are found. But once it gets to these 2000 candidate lines or six offshore wind power plants, the greedy search is approximately 10 times faster. Looking at an even larger, more realistic problem in this situation, we're going to look at the Belgian offshore area. Now the Belgian offshore area, we have a P point of common coupling. It's the substation at Zebruja. And then we have eight concessions. These concessions, they all have GPS coordinates as well as the point of common coupling. And the entire region is approximately two gigawatts. So to simplify the problem, each concession is considered one eighth of that, or 250 megawatts. And this actually makes sense as an assumption because remember, it's a greenfield problem. So we're trying to find a transmission system for the entire area, really before even the concessions are completely decided. And in this problem, we're going to consider OSS positioning. So because doing this increases the number of candidates so drastically, only a 220 kV grid is considered. So in the mixed integer problem, this is how we start the model. We transform the GPS into a Cartesian coordinate, and then we place candidate OSS. In this case, we've chosen 160 OSS locations to allow various topological connections. Then we add HV cables. Now you see immediately the number of HV cables is huge once you start having many positions of OSS. Medium voltage cables on top of this, we're well over 37,000 binary um, equipment variables. This is an intractable problem size. So what do we do? Okay. Well, in this case, we've employed clustering, where we then divide the problem up into three different problems. Each one can be solved individually. Then we take the solution spaces from each one of these, combine it into one, and, and solve another, so a cascading mixed integer problem with the final solution space. It's now solvable, but of course, there's no guarantee that the optimal solution found doing this is the optimal solution of the original very large problem. But we do get a solution. It's a fairly good one, in fact. It has 
three offshore substations, two connections to shore, and then one OSS to OSS connection. The remainder uh, of the lines are all medium voltage. But the computation time is big. It's about nine days to solve this problem. Now that's okay for a 1.1 billion euro project. An extra week is not a big deal at the start. But when we solve the same problem with greedy search, we get a different topology. It's not the same, but it's about 2% less. Okay, 2% on 1.1 billion, who cares? But what we do care about is that the computation time is now in seconds versus days. That's, that's a big difference. The other thing that we can notice is that uh, because Greedy Search finds a full set of solutions, we can examine other solutions that are lower or more expensive, sorry, than the, the optimal. And within those solutions, we find this one here. And I'll apologize just to bring your, your attention to this. This number eight, I, I started at one here and zero here. But this number eight and this number nine are the same offshore wind power plant. I realize it too late, but uh, don't be confused by that. Uh, this topology and this topology are actually the identical topologies. You have three offshore substations, two export cables, and an OSS to OSS cable. The equipment returned was also the same, same size cables, same size transformers. So the only difference between these two that makes up this cost difference is that the OSS are positioned in slightly different locations, allowing for, albeit a very small, reduction in uh, required cable. But um, despite this necessarily not being uh, a reduction that's that's worthwhile of caring about because of the, the, the percentage on the overall project, what it does show is that the solution space of, of the greedy algorithm is actually quite high quality because the best returned by the mixed integer program was just one of the solutions found within the hierarchy um, of solutions by Greedy Search. And in fact, it made a slightly better version of it. So, in summary, as we're getting near the end of time here, the offshore wind topology optimization problem is a topic that's designed to find the optimal topology equipment and topological layout for high voltage transmission systems where multiple offshore wind power plants are considered. The approach is a mixed integer problem. This has drawbacks that are the search space becomes severely restricted because we just can't handle enough candidate equipment. You can't really solve for an optimal location of the OSS. Tracking of wind profiles isn't possible, which is something unique to offshore wind, specifically in this situation, that uh, we really need to be able to do. When employing problem reduction techniques, we run into the fact that we can no longer guarantee optimality, which was one of the main reasons for choosing this formulation in the first place. And the solution space is singular, so you only get one topology. So if it's right, that's awesome. If it's not, you're totally out of luck and you got to start from scratch. We developed what we think is a better approach using a greedy algorithm. It searches the entire combinatorial search space, so it manages to really include all options. It guarantees the placement of the OSS and guarantees the selection of equipment to be optimal. Because you're looking at nodal uh, summations, you can track wind profiles very easily as well. So it's beautifully suited for wind pro problems. And the solution space returns uh, not just k equals n wind farms, but all optimal topologies of k less than or equal to n wind farms. So you get a lot of solutions to compare. And the biggest advantage, of course, is the reduction in computational time. For the case we looked at, it was nine days down to 693 seconds. 
Moving forward with this formulation, the next thing that we'll be doing is introducing some constraints that have been found uh, applying machine learning techniques, specifically association rule mining. There's been some results with this stage so far that in certain problem layouts, um, a further reduction of about half can be had on the computational time with the same end result. And then finally, the, the goal really is, despite greedy search being a wonderful solution in this particular case, there are of course restrictions to that form of optimization. And this is, this is the benefit as to why often people have chosen mixed integer programs in the past. That's because they're a little more flexible for adding new constraints for different objective functions and optimization constraints. So, this greedy search will really be developed into a pre-processing candidate reduction algorithm that will produce only essential topologies that can then be analyzed in perhaps a topology-based mixed integer program. So rather than individual ones and zeros for cables, you could have a one and zero for the entire topology. And that would allow a much larger problem to be solved. Finally, um, once that's done, new constraints are to be added. And the goal is a stepwise, least regret, robust modular grid expansion technique uh, or tool. And that tool, we hope to produce a Julia package that can be integrated well into the other Julia packages that the decision support group at ASAT has been created, or has been created, creating, um, and integrate all these tools together to have a, a powerful set of tools for planning uh, future grids. That brings us to the end of the presentation. I'll now open up the floor to questions.